We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the opportunity and the blessing to be able to remember Karbala and Imam Hussein and this time. As you know, Ashura is a time for sadness, a time for grief, and a time for remembrance. And but I think it's also more so a time for learning and bettering yourself. Um, one of my main points I want to get at is what can we take away from Ashura? And what personalities can we use in as, as examples? We can use all personalities, but I wish to focus on tonight, Ali al Akbar alayhi salatu was salam. Ali al Akbar's poetic lines on Ashura before he was martyred are very, very, very um, representative of what we should do in order to better ourselves, in order to become what Imam Hussein intended for us to become as a nation. When I first heard these lines, um, I heard them in Arabic. I didn't really know what they meant, but they still resonate within you, um, even if you don't know what they mean, because it's just so powerful the way that he says it, and if you know the situation that he was in at the time. At the time, Imam Ali al-Akbar, he was one of the last people to be martyred before his father, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So just imagine, A man, 18, some say 18, some say 27, going out to the battlefield. Going out to the battlefield, he sees this vast army, thousands of people. All and He knows he's, he's going to die, but that doesn't matter. As long as the message of Aba Abdullah lives on, then he is content. So I want to read you the lines of his poetry. I wish to read them in Arabic first because I just feel like Arabic is such a, a good language for communicating emotion. Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali Nahnu wa bayt Allahi awla bin Nabi Min shifth dhaka wa min shimr al-da'dani أضرب بالسيف حتى يلتوي ضرب ضرب أولى من هاشمي علوي ولا أزال اليوم أحمي عن أبي والله لا يحكم فينا ابن الدعي صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد What does he say? He says I am Ali, son of Hussein, son of Ali. We, by the house of God, are worthier of the Prophet. More than Shif and from Shimr, the lowly. I will strike you with my sword until it warps. The strike of a youth of Hashim and of Ali. And I will not disband on this day. I will defend my father. By Allah, we will never be ruled by the son of the illegitimate. So, this poetry, I really believe, is what, um, what answered the call of Aba Abdullah when he was alone on the battlefield, when he said, Hal min nasirin yansuruna, when he said, is there not someone to... help us. This is not someone to help us. I believe these lines of poetry answered that call. But the thing is, his death happened before Imam Hussein 
had died. So who is he talking to? Who is he talking to? Is he just talking to the dead that are around him? All the slain that were... All the shaheed around him? Who is he talking to? He's talking to us. So he's talking to us. How do we become a Nasirin? How do we... How do we help Imam Hussein in his mission? Because his words, his call resonated throughout time, throughout the whole universe. And they continue to resonate today. And in fact, they get stronger every year with every, every Ashura. So what do we have to do? What, what do we do here in America? Obviously, we can't, we, we're not in a state of war here, so we can't. Um, you know, kill kill people. You know, there's no one. Real, there's no big enemy here that's really oppressing us. As far as like, like physically, but what can we do to help Imam Hussein? Either way, well, we can use the poetry of Imam of Ali Al Akbar alayhi salam, but in a different way. See, to me, what those lines of poetry that I read, they convey to me that one should never give up, no matter what the circumstances. If he's being attacked from satanic forces, be it from the jinn or man. So, if society pressures you to act against your beliefs, then refer back to these lines of poetry. Refer back to him and see how brave he was. He stood in front of an army so vast, yet he still stayed true to his religion, defending his father and not accepting oppression. So, if our Imam were to come tomorrow, um, then we got to be ready, we got to be qualified, you know? We can't expect to just be amongst his army without properly following the religion. And all you have to do to follow it properly, I believe, just ask, ask yourself every time you want to do something, ask yourself, would Abba Abdullah approve of this? Would he want me to do this? Just ask yourself that before you do it. And then, inshallah, you'll be guided in the right direction. So, with this, I conclude my short talk. Um, so, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And actually, let me, before, before I step down, I just want to recite uh, Ziyarat al-Imam al-Hussein, the short one. So, if you guys know it, follow along. If you don't, you don't have to. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Wa ala al-arwah al-lati halat bifinaik. Alaykum minni jami'an. Salamu allahi abadan ma baqeet. Wa baqiya al-laylu wa ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين الله سبحانه محمد وعلى محمد ما شاء الله ما شاء الله جزاك الله خيرا ما شاء الله مبارك Let's recite his last salawat for Brother Ali Fakhreddin, inshaAllah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Do I have any questions um, ready to pose at this point? It's a Q&A. This is a question and answer session, absolutely. Now, I see some smiling faces and some lost faces. Um, I know that 
Um, one of the questions that's been previously asked has been um, um, has been uh, that, uh, and we briefly discussed this before, that how come the the uprising that occurred, um, given that we believe the lineage of uh, the Prophet Muhammad السلام, have pretty much all been in sync. How come the, the, the uprising that, that took place uh, did not take place during Imam Ali uh, or, his, or his first son, Imam Hassan um, So maybe um, we can start with Brother Saramat and pass the mic. So the question is that, uh, why is it that we saw the uprising with Imam Hussain al-Islam and not with the Imams after him or the Imams before him? Before. Both. Is that both? Well, if you, if you take a look at history, you see that uh, Imam Ali al-Islam and Imam Hassan both engaged in wars. Um, so to say that, for example, those two Imams did not engage in fighting against oppressive forces would be incorrect. Uh, now, after, after Imam Hussein alayhi salam, uh, the situation had changed, and it appears that, and Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, it appears that uh, after the role of Abu Abdullah alayhi salam in establishing the uh, fundamental idea that Ahl Bayt alayhi salatu wa salam are against these uh, khulafa, they are against these rules, they have nothing to do with this government. This Hujjah, this argument uh, in its fullest capacity was established by Abu Abdullah salam. So that afterwards, um, the other Imma could, you know, uh, practice the religion, teach the religion, uh, teach classes, allow people to learn. Abu Abdullah salam in his situation uh, wasn't capable of that. I mean, he only had a very short amount of time. He was consistently being, you know, pushed into into various uh, situations, and it didn't allow him to to preach and to teach the way that you saw took place during the times of, uh, for example, Imam uh, Qadim al Islam, Imam Baqir, Imam Sadiq, uh, and Imam Sajjad. But then after that, we saw that the other subsequent Imams were put into uh, various situations where they were uh, essentially under arrest. They were put into um, basically kept away from society. So uh, it's not that the Imams uh, didn't you know, stand up or, or take stances against the governments. It's that the situation of Imam Hussein al-Islam was, was different. As I said, the hujjah was established. Another thing to look at is that there were various um, uprisings that took place during the lives of the other Imam that the Imams were uh, supportive of. Now, because of the situations that they were in, they could not actually uh, participate. But we have many hadiths that, for example, the Imams were very supportive of Zayd, and they, they called him Shaheed, and they mentioned many, many good things about him. There was also Hussein ibn Ali uh, during the situation of Fakh, which happened during the time of Musa Qadim, in which was an uprising that the Imams <coughs> spoke about. Um, uh, ibn Tab, Tab, like the name Tabat uh, we have uh, one of the, the reason that, that that name comes to us. We, we see the name Tabat Tabai among some sayyids. It's because one of the uh, one of the sayyids, his name was, I believe, he had a, he had a lakab, he had a a way of he had a nickname. They used to call him um, Ibn Qab, I think it was, but he couldn't pronounce it. He would say Tab. In any case, he lived during the time of Musa Qadim alayhi salam. I forget his name, his lineage. He was coming from Imam Hassan, and he also had a revolution. And during that time, an Imam, an, an Imam uh, Musa Rida, sorry, not Imam Qadim, Imam Musa Rida supported that revolution and, and spoke very, very, very good about him. So it's not that the Imams, you know, uh, had anything against uprisings. It's just that the situation varied over time. I don't have anything else to add to that. <laughs> it seems that the event of Ashura, when you look at it, considering all the 
references that have been pointed to this event prior to the event, the actual historical moment of it, and whatever was referred to it after that. This tells us that there was a grand divine plan in place from long, long, long time ago that it had a, a wisdom. It was not just out of blue. The wisdom was that you have to have some specific pieces of the puzzle getting together to give a big picture of the whole thing. And in order to do that, you need different circumstances and different stages of the progression. What I have been trying to develop in here and share with our sisters and brothers is that, well, of course, this is a huge plan and you cannot cover every aspect of it. It's just in just, just one session. I'm trying to show that there was a plan that was the most reasonable, the most wise way of doing what the goal of uh, that creation was. The goal of creation was creating a perfected mankind. That is the utmost goal and uh, uh, destination of this creation. Now, how can we get to that point? That is the question, right? Uh, what is the, the style of the movement toward that goal? Can we do that overnight? If not, then what is the, the steps to take here uh, in, in order to achieve that moment, that, that, uh, that goal? Of course, sending uh, revelations down and appoint, appointing the prophets is part of this puzzle. But we will see, inshallah, in future nights, I have three more nights time. If I was alive, I would, I would try to cover this phenomenon and show there was a plan that has a lot to do with the philosophy of the prophethood. It was not just out of blue, something that accidentally happened. It's not about that. It was a very, very well calculated and well orchestrated plan by Allah. That major part of it and the turning point of it was Ashura. And that has continued to, to this moment because of that wisdom behind this whole plan. The, the question is what is that plan and how can we rationalize this? There was a huge uh, wisdom behind all what the other Imams did, they w were not here to, ma to, to wage wars or battles. They have a much more sophisticated and complex thinking of how we can lead the humanity toward salvation. But in order to do that, there were several steps to take one of them. A turning point of it actually was the event of Ashura. It was planned, and it was in the wisdom of uh, that grand plan, uh, I believe. And that is not just because Imam Hussein was braver than the others, or Yazid was worse than the others. None of that. None of that. It was not because Imam Hussein had a chance to win, whereas the others didn't have a chance to win. None of that. The, historically, by the solid facts of history, we can prove none of these allegations are mm, correct. Imam Hussein knew what's going to happen. Not only he knew it, Imam Hassan knew it by the factual things re recorded in the history. Not only them, Imam Ali knew it. Imam Ali, when he comes from Sefin back, he stops at the place Karbala and prays and cries and says stuff that is now recorded in the history about the thing that is going to happen in this very moment in a very piece of land. It was not just something out of blue happening accidentally. We have to understand this. So look at Ashura as a, in a much bigger and larger perspective in order to 
I, I answered those questions. And I hope within a couple of nights that I have, three nights that I have, we will be able to address those aspects in our extent of uh, ability. Thank you. Sir. Mike is going to make it there. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was just uh, wanted to mention that uh, when we talk about uprising, we just need to remember that uh, uh, the Imam Hussein was invited to Israel. So he didn't go to fight. He was going to respond to the needs of the people who were asking him to go to Israel. And when he went there, he the Yazis and the um, enemies were already prepared to fight him. So even when Imam Hussein said, you guys invited me to come, and if you want me to go back, I just go back. But they were the ones who were fighting to Imam Hussein and his family and companion, and Imam Hussein was just in a defensive situation. He, he never went planning to fight with people. Even though it's a divine goal, but the divine plan, but it was never meant to be a fight and killing and killing people. But it just shows us and teaches us that we should really do what is right, even though at the end we might be all killed. So the point that I that I understood was um, there was a divine plan, uh, and, and, and Imam Hussein has clearly and historically illustrated that he did, in fact, consider and put, put forth the consideration that, well, if really me going to Kufa is the reason for why I should be martyred and I should be, and my family should be slaughtered like this, won't then let me return. And he, he did mention that, and, and that's been recorded in history. Um, but, uh, but clearly, the, the, the opportunity was not given to go back and and I would argue that that the Imam w knew well that by offering this the response would absolutely be uh, no uh, and the tragedy would, would continue on its course uh, any any of our speakers want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, it sounds to me like you were just clarifying the English term uprising Right. Uh, uprising in English has kind of a uh, offensive connotation, right, or like an aggressive, yes. an aggressive connotation to it. So I think she was just providing a clarification of, of that word. Um, I, I think that's all. I think that was her only point. But I think we're all in the same understanding of, you know, of the point she was making. Yeah. Well, one point that we can add to this, if, you, if I may, and that is historically, if you look at the course of Imam Hussein's movement, you will see that uh, when, uh, when Moabia went to hell, uh, the, uh, the messenger came to Medina and reported the event to the governor of Medina and then asked, the, according to what, what was ordered by Yazid, to get pledge of allegiance from three significant figures. That, that was actually the uh, advice that Moabiyah has left for Yazid a long time ago. And that was in Rajab, month of Rajab. Within three days, Imam Hussein, this is a huge event that happened at the first, that same night inside the, uh, the uh, State Department, in, inside the governor's house. And uh, I don't want to address that detail of historical event. Then Imam Hussein decided to move, and the revolt was uh, kicked in at that moment, and that was month of Rajat. Rajat, Sha'ban, Ramazan, Shabbal, Zelhaj. Six months is the course of his movement from Medina, knowing exactly what he is going to do, because he announced it publicly, clearly that I am revolting, I'm not gonna barge to this nonsense. I'm revolting. I have started. Whoever wants to come with us, let's go. Let's do it. And then at that moment, six months before, seven months before the event of Karbala, people advise him. I, 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 if I had time, I would love to 
uh, elaborate on the detail of the historical facts that are recorded that people knew what's going to happen to him and he, they, they, they clearly knew what's going to do or what he is planning to do and he, they, everybody knew that not everybody, many of them including uh, Muhammad ibn Anafi, including Ibn Abd Abbas, including uh, the, the Prophet uh, Abdullah Umar and the, uh, the Prophet's wife uh, the good wife of the brother, I forgot him. Um, um, Salam, Ahsan. These are all recorded in the history. They told him, no, don't go this way. We know what's going to happen to you. Even Holy Prophet gave uh, Um Salam a, a piece of, uh, a glass of, uh, contains some soil that is going to turn color when that event is going to happen. God only knows what, what time, but they, they had that all the, the uh, at that moment, there was no such a thing as invitation from Kufi whatsoever. Imam received the first letters, batch of letters, according to history, when he was in Mecca, in Zil Hajjah. It's six months later. That was not the source. It is a very, very disservice to, to his movement. That is, we tell them people invited him. That's why he got fooled and went there. And then, oops, sorry, we, we changed mind. Now you are done. No, that's what's not happened. This is not to explain the Imam Hussein's movement, please. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to, is this on this topic? I just wanted to add a comment. Uh, I think later it's in the middle it's not good to have I just know that uh, there's a book by Shaykh Mutahari, Hamar Sayyid Mutahari, and there's a book by Mahum Saleh in Najafabadi, Shahid Jawi. And there's a debate between these two that whether the Qiyam was for Matildam and Amr al Arab Nahjad Munjad or it was for making the uh, Islamic government. So, and they are answering each other. And so, Mahum Mutahari and Mahum Shahidi, they are saying this. It was because of the Matildam and Amla Rukhnyakas Munja and Mahum Saleh Najafabadi says it's because of the making the Islamic government and next after that he says no way in Madrid. So I wanted to invite everybody to look at these good books and just that. Thank you, brother. You know, I think what, what is critical is that, um, you know, we're not passive observers here at best, uh, that we take the initiative to look at the different perspectives that are out there and really uh, everybody's present here because uh, obviously it's, it's a topic that's, uh, that's important to us and, uh, and alhamdulillah the resources are, are, are many and, and certainly the, the few nights uh, of lectures that we have remaining are also potentially beneficial in making sure that we can get some uh, new perspective inshallah. So we'll move on to the next question, inshallah. Thank you guys for coming out and speaking and becoming a panel for us. Uh, my question is about um, Ashura, the day of Ashura. And we know the Ahlul Sunnah and, and their claim to that the day of Ashura is a day of celebration, a good day. And I just wanted to know from you guys, how much weight does that hold? And how would you respond to them when they have such programs and they say, oh, this is a good day and, and you know, these type of uh, claims that they make? Uh, how much, and how much weight do, do we have with this same claim that like, Moses freed the Jews on this day so we should celebrate it or fast on this day? Thank you. So uh, before I answer, how I would respond to it. What do you mean by how much weight? Is like how strong is their hadith? How credible oh. is their hadith on this subject? Um, so the, their, um, tra their traditions on this subject uh, have been sort of, ha have been uh, criticized and sort of analyzed and scrutinized very strongly by many of our ulama. Uh, there's a wonderful book that's written in English I can't remember the title, but it's by um, uh, Sayyid Saeed Akhtar Rizvi. Um, man, I can't remember the title. Uh, but he, he wrote a very long uh, sort of uh, essay, sort of really analyzing these traditions from Ahl Sunnah. 
um, and, and their authenticity and really giving a very critical eye to them. So put that aside, because if you're talking to someone, you know, who, who is Sunni about this, you know, you, you're not going to have a long conversation with them and getting the, the technical, you know, problems with all these traditions. I mean, you, you know, that's, that, that, that kind of stuff never works in a conversation, right? You know, if you're ever talking to someone, right? You just, you, don't go down that avenue, you know. <laughs> Point them to the book if they want to read it, you know, good. You know, you read it to be informed, but if they read it, you know, inshallah, I'll be great. I, I mean, I, as far as, you know, how, you know, when I had uh, conversations with um, some fellow grad students who were Muslim on the subject, you know, I, I really just, uh, I, I try to appeal to their logic, uh, in, you know, in the sense that, you know, I would say, I say, okay, you know, you know, put, um, you know, put, put, the, put those traditions aside, you know, for a second, you know, who, as, as, as Muslims, you know, who, who is, uh, who is closer to us, um, you know, the, you know, Musa and what happened to his people during her, during that time, or Prophet Noah, what happened to his people during that time or the Holy Prophet's grandson, um, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, uh, and what happened to him on that day. Who, you know, who sh which one should we care about more in the sense of which one we're gonna have more of an emotional attachment to? Um, you know, who, who is closer, who, who is closer to us in our belief? Who, who did the Prophet, you know, love and speak about more? This is grandson. The pro, you know, the, the the prophet didn't, um, you know, the prophet didn't uh, sort of emphasize, you know, you know any of any of, you know all the other things that um, you know the, the prophet did during his life. It wasn't to uh, to sort of emulate uh, what um, <laughs> you know. That's what the verse in the Quran says, right? You know that you know the prophet came to confer what was sent before. <coughs> um, but to replace it, right? To replace it with a new religion, a new way of a new way of life, and, and that is that is what Islam is. So, you know, I, you know, I, I sort of you know just try to you know appeal to them in that way that you know who you know who should we care about more, right? <laughs> you know, should should we you know is it is it more important to remember how the Prophet's grandson was brutally murder than the brave stand that he took? Or is it more important to, you know, celebrate the uh, day when, um, the day when, uh, you know, the Bani Israel was, uh, uh, you know, what was, uh, what they say, I, they say, the tradition says that that was a day when they were freed, right, from, from the church of, of Firaun. Um, you know, Sure, you can say both are good, but I tried to appeal to them in the sense that if you had to rank order them, which one made more sense? That, 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 that was that sort of my. A few uh, points that I can briefly share with you. One of them is that, you know, uh, brothers, Sunni brothers have a set of six books that are their most authentic. Uh, pillars and uh, reference of the uh, Hadith and narrations, they call it Sahaha Sitt. These are the most uh, authentic books. The number one of them is Sahih Bukhari, right? I believe Sahih Bukhari, if I am wrong, please correct me, it has some 4,000 Hadiths in it. And the, in the introductory he says that I uh, evaluated and read and uh, collected like 300,000, if I'm not wrong, with the number 300,000 something hadith, out of which I found only this amount, this number like 4,000, was worthy of narrating. What does that tell us? And there are so many other more of, and more of resources that historically can, you can see what was the story of a hadith? What happened to the story of a hadith? Just a brief uh, synopsis of it as, as it relates to our occasion here is that Muawiyah had a factory of fabrication of a hadith. And he has officially 
sponsored and established a factory like a mass production of Ahadis and narrations. That almost every single one of them was against Islamic teachings and the true Islam. That's how we are standing today at, this, at where, where we are standing right now, the whole Islamic world. Because of the huge, huge amount of the fabricated and wrong and lie uh, uh, under the name of, you know, how this person like Abu Huraira, who has been living, I think, uh, in the time of Holy Prophet is like, like two years or something, around that, that number of years. He had been. He is the most prolific author of narrations for this book. I mean, this is how uh, the collection of the Ahadis has been generated throughout the history, and there has been money behind it. Has been the power, the most powerful government of the whole world at the time was supporting, providing, and sponsoring this kind of fabrication of, this is not a small thing. So, bring up Ahadis, it's just, <laughs> it's a joke. Unless you really have uh, gone through a very, very sophisticated uh, uh, scientific method to, uh, to verify the authenticities. It's kind of hard to open up that can of books. It's that, not that easy. Kind of worms Correct. It, because they could turn around and say the same thing. Well, everything we know about Ashura is through Ahadith. Right. So how do we know that that's true? You know, but like what, once you sort of go down that avenue on this particular issue, it it can, at least my experience in talking with Ahlul Sunnah, it can be hard to, it, you, you know, you, you can forget what you were talking about at the beginning. Right? I yeah. agree with you. This is a very sophisticated question in terms of technical things. I have not myself investigated on the authenticity of that particular hadith that they, they are narrating, but I know that uh, Sheikh Abbas Umi, who was you know, well known, you know him, uh, the, uh, the author of Mahfotiul Janan, he has done that as one of the many, many of the uh, scholars that have done this kind of uh, uh, investigation and has prove that this is, uh, has no hope, no basis. Thank you. I, I'm going to switch to, um, for the sake of gender equality, I'm going to switch to one of our sister's questions. Um, and the question is, how can we explain to others, uh, specifically non-Muslims, why we, in uh, quotations, allow um, or encourage young children to listen and or hear uh, or even see stories and reenactments of, uh, of, of such a tragedy, um, uh, specifically concerning the, the violence and, and the details of, of that. Um, and so, um, how can we explain uh, our, our current, this, this cultural phenomena uh, in, in, in words that they can understand, uh, as some of them feel like this may be just bad parenting? For the very young ones? So, how do we explain to non-Muslims why we encourage this to, uh, to be witnessed or heard or in participation of, 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 uh, of, of young children, and actually the specified eight years of age and older? Is the question clear? I think so. So, I would say, um, Children that are, um, the developmental stage that um, you go through as a young person from the age of eight and older, um, discussing, discussing Ashura is, is very, very important at, at that stage um, because, so, let me, let me step back. <laughs> so, uh, if, as far as the actual, um, details of what happened on Ashura as far as, you know, you know, how um, the sick, you know, body limbs were severed or, you know, how, you know, arrows were pierced uh, into, you know, parts of the body and things like that. Um, you know, these, 
these type of details, you know, um, are uh, these type of details. I don't think someone could argue are bad parenting. If you know, but a parent should should determine at what age they you know they feel it's age appropriate you know for their child to be able to hear it. Um, you know, with you know, sort of. Um, Yeah, <laughs> you know, the, uh, you know, uh, um, I, you know. I, I, I think uh, you know, a parent can decide because the main, the main message of, of Ashura, right, is, and the purpose of Ashura is not about you know, and the purpose of retelling the story of Ashura is not the, if you want to call them the gory details per se, right? You know, um, I mean that that is part of the tragedy, but that's as we all know, right? That's not the main central, uh, central message. Um, you know, non-Muslims seeing it um, as as uh, bad parenting. You know, even amongst non-Muslims, there's a huge range of what they people think is correct and incorrect for their child. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, you know, and of course, amongst Muslims too. And so, you know, hearing. Uh, Hearing, you know, a story, um, uh, particular, you know, you know, he hearing a story um, about these things happening, I think, is probably healthier and better for um, a, for a child to hear, even about the gory details, uh, because then the actual image of it is something that that they create in their own mind. You know, it's, it's different than sort of. You know, seeing uh, seeing images, uh, seeing a picture, uh, which can be much more vivid, much more uh, shocking, uh, you know, and, and perhaps uh, longer lasting. It's actually and it's actually healthier. You know, the, the you know before you know the modern times, right? Where you know, everything is digital images, um, right? Stories were told orally, right? You know, and, and they were um, you know people communicate a lot through oral and. And when you when you hear stories and you get to you know create the the scene in your own head, um, a lot of times it's it's much richer for you and it sticks uh, very um, very it, it stays with you for a long time. Um, uh, another important point that that I would just point you know so, something that um, that I had to think about a, a lot, in particular when it comes to um, the story of, of Ashura is that the story of Ashura is very important in in making it clear, you know, what is truth and what is falsehood. Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? What is you know what is correct and what is false? And and actually, that's very important as far as a young person's worldview to have a very clear understanding of what is, who, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And, and also, not only that, to have a very strong love and attachment for the good guys and to hate the bad guys. And, and particularly, I would say here, you know, in, in our Western societies, probably even amongst a lot of, I know even for me, using that particular language can be very off-putting. You know, you know, especially to, you know, to other people. It's like, oh, you're teaching your child to hate? How, how can you, we don't, how can you hate? No, yes, you, no, yes. <laughs> hate is a, hate is a valid emotion and a very important one, right? What are the, what are the last two um, of the uh, Furuadin? I mean, what are the last two of the Furuadin? Uh, I don't know. You remember? Anybody remember? Last two. I know, I know some of the sisters know. Tawalla and Tabara. Masha yeah. Tawalla and Tabara. Salut salawat for her. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. These are part of the essentials. Well, the, branches or you know, essential elements of our religion to love those who love and are
close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to despise and to separate ourselves and to hate. I think it's it's good to use that English word, which a lot of people, you know, maybe you told them not most of oh, it's like, you know, it's, it's almost like an unusual word to use in, in normal conversation. It is an unusual word to, to use. Um, but it's a very appropriate one for this. And it's actually, and it's a very appropriate one word to introduce to a child. You know, it's not something that, oh, you have to wait till someone is mature and go through puberty. No, 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 no. As a six, seven, eight, nine-year-old, it's, it's, it's good at that point in your development to have a very clear world view, to love the good and to hate the evil. Um, and, and there's no other, and, and that is one of the beautiful things that the story of Ashura really exemplifies and really sort of drives home and you know, illustrates the, this very important point. Um, so, you know, it, um, you know, communicating, communicating that to a non-Muslim, um, it kind of depends on kind of where they're at. Uh, because many non-Muslims, if they're not, if they don't follow a religion, they kind of, you know, which a lot of, at least the one, I'm not sure, you know, the person knows, who asked the question knows, the, you know, the, the people that they know. Um, I, I think sometimes you'll, you'll find people it just depends, but you know, a lot, a lot of people that, that don't have any strong beliefs about anything kind of have a hard time seeing this because you know they they don't they don't have any strong convictions about anything, you know, which is how so many secular people are here in the states, you know. So if, <laughs> um, you know, kind of getting them to you know to really understand that is is not really easy because um, you know they, they you know they. They don't. They don't. Uh, they don't. They don't kind of have really strong beliefs about anything else. So to get them to have a strong opinion or feeling about this can, can be hard. Um, but I don't. Know. I, I hope I somewhat answered the person's question. <laughs> Just quickly, maybe I can add something. So there was an incident that happened. I remember um, that one scholar was talking about. He said that there was a group of people. They said that uh, people should stop. Um, having seen as any having uh, let them with for men with their shirts off right so this is what somebody was saying so the scholar made a very very good point and that is what happens is sometimes and I, whether condoning it or condemning it doesn't really matter the point is the point he said what happens is that sometimes shaitan makes people focus on one thing and leave another so he said you're telling us to stop you know having people do this with their shirts off but we never hear anybody complaining about when they show for example, swimming competition. We never hear, really, we never hear anybody complaining, for example, when they have a uh, wrestling competition, or other things where they're wearing like tight clothing on TV, and, and nobody complains. But when it comes to something religious, the person has all these complaints. So what I would say to this person is you live in a society where children as, as young as five and six years old are exposed to so many horrible and filthy things and, and you really think that, for example, it's, it's problematic for them to hear a tale, a story that teaches them morality. Whereas in this society, for example, at the age of six or seven, God knows what they're listening to on the radio. And nobody seems to have, that's, 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 not, that's not a problem. Well, then no, no worries. And our kids can listen to that. But if uh, somebody talks about somebody getting murdered for, for justice, oh, no, we've got to stop right now. It's, it's, it's shaitan. That's all it is. And that's, and that's the way I would address it to them. Your humble brothers uh, really covered most of the things. I just want to add one more thing that I, I believe is strongly uh, should be highlighted, and that is what we should do for the kids is just take them to the programs in which they commemorate Ashura. Let them have an experience, personal experience, from just doing the commemoration and lamentation. You even might not need that much to elaborate on the detail of the stories, even though there are a lot of things that we can do with the stories. But the most important thing, I have a reason that you may uh, agree with me after all my sessions are completed, then you will see why I think that, that this way. The most important thing that you can do and you should do 
is to take the kids to the place where others, the adults, are commemorating what we're saying, just to see and have a personal uh, experience and try your best to make it a pleasant or as pleasant as possible of an experience. Having fun, that's fine. In that atmosphere of sorrow and sadness and crying, try to make it as pleasant and as memorable in a good sense for the kids. That's the most thing that you can do for your kids. So, I mean, forget about all the story and detail of the stories. You don't need that, as, as long as you do this one. Well, um, we'd like to transition into, inshallah, uh, a brief um, Azadari session in, in English, uh, led by Brother uh, Samad Ashur. Um, and uh, I personally have really benefited from, from this panel. Uh, we only really got to... Um, three questions that have been proposed. Um, I do apologize to uh, um, the couple of brothers and sisters who still had questions to be answered, but alhamdulillah the discussion was so warm. Uh, we just simply couldn't cover everybody and then inshallah we'll get another opportunity once again. I, I can stay, if they want me to, I can stay after after this session here. If anybody wants to ask any questions, I will be more than happy to share. The YMA is also selling T-shirts uh, with with Yah Hussein, um, and, and inshallah, if if you like to see them, uh, Brother Amir is the is the uh, uh, the person responsible uh, for the health and well-being of our uh, of our panelists. Uh, let's recite the last salawat. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We ask Allah to send His praise down on Muhammad and his household Ya Allah we wish to enter into the remembrance of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. We want to enter into the haram of Imam Hussein. But Ya Allah, how can we enter into that pure place when we are covered with sins? Allahi qalbi mahjoob wa nafsi فكيف هيلتي يا ستار الغيوب يا الله our hearts are veiled our souls are suppressed إلهي our عقل is overturned by our desires our tongues are covered in sin so what hope is there for us Ya Allah, Ya Allah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to free us by the right of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And through Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad we seek repentance, we seek forgiveness. May the light of Muhammad shower on us so that we can enter purely into the haram of Abu Abdullah. 
أستغفر الله وأتوب إليه سيد السكينة when they were on the journey to Sham one night she had a dream she saw in her dream Sayyida Fatima al Zahra she ran to her grandmother she said my grandmother I want to tell you about what happened my grandmother they disrespected us they hit us, they beat us, they imprisoned us, they killed your son, yeah, you killed your son, Hussein. She said, in my dream, say the Fatima said, stop, stop, ya Sukaina. Your words are ripping my heart apart. I have the shirt of your father, Hussein, and I will hold on to it till the day of judgment. Ya Hussein. Madnoon Hussein, Madnoon Hussein, Ya Hussein. Ya Sayyid al-Zahra, we ask Allah to help us to fulfill our duty to Fatima al-Zahra, to cry for Abba Abdullah. We ask Imam Zaman to help us to take us by the hand to take us to Karbala, to show us, to let us see, let us not let go of this rope of Hussein, so that we can follow in this caravan. Ya Imam Zaman, we've left you, we forgot about you, take us by the hand and take us to Karbala. Show us, Imam Zaman, he tells us about Karbala and his ziyarat Nahiyah. He said, peace be upon those bodies which were left uncovered. Peace be on those severed limbs. Peace be upon those torn collars. As-salamu ala qatilatil madloom. As-salamu ala aqihil masloom. السلام على العلي الكبير السلام على رضي الصغير علي أكبر يا علي الكبير on the way to Ash on the way to Karbala one night Imam Hussein عليه السلام had a dream he woke up and he was startled Ali Akbar asked his father, Oh my father, what did you see? What happened? He said, I heard a voice saying that this caravan is heading to martyrdom. Ali Akbar said, Oh father, are we not on the right? His father said, Yes. He said, Then we have nothing to fear from death. Imam Hussein said, Oh may Allah bless you my son. May Allah put you amongst the righteous. On the day of Ashura, all the companions of Imam Hussein alayhi salam had fallen and all that was left was his family. The first from his family to come to Abu Abdullah to ask permission was Ali al-Akbar. Imam Hussein immediately told him yes. He didn't deny his son. Ali Akbar went by the women to say his farewell. They started to cry. They started to slap themselves. Ya Ali Al Akbar. He came back to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam put his hands on his shoulders. He looked him in the face. He stared at his face for a long time and he started to cry. One time a Christian man came to Abba Abdullah alayhi salam and he said, I saw your prophet in a dream. Imam Hussein said, hold on, wait, bring out Ali Akbar. He said to the Christian man, is this the man that you saw? Ali Akbar looked just like the prophet. <laughs> 
Imam Hussein bid his son farewell. Ali Akbar started to go out to the battlefield. Imam Hussein he called out, Allahumma ashhad ala ha'ula al-qawm. فقد برز عليهم غلاما أشبه الناس خلقا وخلقا ومنطقا لرسوله وكان إذا أشتقنا إلى نبيك نظرنا إليه He said, Oh Allah, witness on these people. I am sending them the one, uh, this boy, who looks most like your prophet, who is most like your prophet in actions, in, in khalq, in khulqan, mantiqan. <laughs> and when we used to miss Rasulullah, we used to look at his face. <laughs> اللهم أرحم اللهم أحرمهم بركات الأرض وفرقهم تفريقا Oh Allah forbid from them the blessings of the earth and cut them into fractions Then he turned to Umar ibn Saad He said Ya Umar ibn Saad قتل الله رحمك كما قتلت رحمي عمر بن سعد may Allah cut off your lineage the way that you cut off my lineage as Ali Akbar started to go out to the battlefield Imam Hussein alayhi salam raised his hands to the sky he recited this verse from the Quran إن الله استفى آدم ونوح وآل إبراهيم وآل إمران على العالمين He said, oh, Allah has selected Adam and Nuh and the family of Ibrahim and the family of Imran over all nations. Abu Abdullah alayhi salam started to cry. Ali Akbar went to the battlefield. Then one person from the enemy called out to him. They said, Ya Ali, you have a relationship with Yazid because your mother is related to Yazid. Let us give you sanctity. Let us give you security. Come to us. <laughs> Ali Akbar called out to them, My relationship with Rasulullah is much greater. Then he called out with his battle poem, An Ali ibn al Hussein. Ali <laughs> Wallah la yahkum afina ibn al-da'i He said, I am Ali ibn, I am Ali the son of Hussein, the son of Ali By the Lord of the Kaaba, we are closer to al-Nabi I will strike you with my sword until it breaks, until it breaks off from the hilt. One of the ulama, they said that they saw Ali Akbar and Abu al-Fadl Abbas in a vision in the, in the realm of the Barzakh, and they were still in their battle gear. They still had their swords drawn till the day of judgment. This is Ali, the son of Hussein, the son of Ali. His words are true, even if they're just poetry. Once he pulled out that sword, he would never put it back. He rode out to the battlefield. He killed 120 men. He came back to his father. Al Atash, Al Atash, Ya Abi. Al Atash, my father the thirst. My father the thirst burns. And the armor is heavy. Is there a drink that I can have? Imam Hussain alayhi salam said there's no water on this day. My son, take hold of my tongue. Maybe there's some moisture in it. Ali Akbar took the hold of the tongue of Imam Hussain, but it was drier than his. 
Imam Hussein said, stay patient, my son. He took off his ring, he put it under the tongue of Ali Akbar. He said, go back out and fight. And I know that soon Rasulullah will give you a drink, and from it you will never be thirsty again. Ali Akbar went out back to the battlefield. He fought bravely, but the thirst, the thirst. Three days of no water, the burning sun, it made him tired. One of the Lain's, Murrah ibn Muntin, he said, I will kill this young boy. As Ali Akbar was busy fighting, he came from behind and he struck a lance into his back. Ali Akbar slumped over, but he didn't fall. He didn't fall down, he kept fighting. The swords came from every direction. They started to strike him from everywhere. He couldn't hold on anymore. Finally an arrow came and struck him in the throat. As he fell off his horse, he called out to his father. Assalamu alaykum ya Abba. <laughs> Imam Hussein ran to his son. <laughs> Imam Hussein fell upon Ali Akbar. He held him in his arms. He kept reciting, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. قتل الله قوما قتلك يا بني May Allah kill the nation that killed you my son يا بني يا بني على دنيا بعدك العفا يا بني On this world after you there is only dust my son Imam Hussein held Ali Akbar in his arms. He put his chest to the chest of Ali Akbar. He cried and cried. The historians say Abba Abdullah cried more for Ali Akbar than anyone on the day of Ashura. Sayyidah Zainab started to cry from the tents. Wow, Sayyidah! Wow, Allah! She came out, she threw herself on the body of Ali Akbar. Imam Hussein alayhi salam lifted her and sent her back to the tents. Then he called the youth of Beni Hashem, come and lift Ali. Come and lift your brother. And they took him away to be buried. Assalamu alayka ya, assalamu alayka ya, Abba Abdullah. Wa ala al-arwah al-lati halat bi fana'ik. Alaykum minni jami'an, salam Allah. أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى وعلى أصحاب الحسين